In this video, we're gonna talk about the tragedy that is the Harry Potter Miniatures Adventure Game. This is my review of the Harry Potter's Miniature Adventure Game Core Box First Edition. So I want to emphasize that this is just the core box experience. I have not played any of the expansions. I did not do the Kickstarter. Uh, and this is for the first edition that I picked up with my son for a very steep discount on Amazon. So I did not pay $120 for this, which I believe is the price that uh, the first edition originally cost and the second edition costs now. Um, I had a hard time figuring that out because the Knights Models website is very difficult to find information on. So. Um, the too long didn't read, if you just want to end this now, is, uh, has, this is a game that has some really interesting elements, but then has a lot of problems. And, it's, and as I speak of the core box experience, it has a lot of feel bad moments to the point where I really don't want to play it. Um, and I know I said before I was going to do a let's play, but I don't want to cause it wouldn't be fun. Uh, I'm going to put timestamps down below for all the various sections. And then I will answer at the end, I'll kind of give my opinion of uh, should you pick up the first edition if you can find it cheap, which you can on Amazon right now, and uh, should you buy the second edition. So before I get into a lot of the details, what's the difference between the first edition and second edition? Uh, so the miniatures are, uh, the quality of the resin is better in the second edition, so I can't speak to that because I'm not um, familiar with resin. So I'll talk about the model specifically in the Should You Buy the First Edition. And then also all of the tokens, all the punch out tokens like these guys, these are all thicker cardboard. Uh, the cards are the same. The rule book, the aesthetics are different. They change, they move pictures around, but the actual rules as written are the same. And the dice are the same and the cards are all the same quality. So as far as I can tell, that is the big difference between the first edition and the second edition. All right, so what is really interesting about this game? The whole spellcasting mechanic just is really, really neat. Um, if you are unfamiliar with how all of this works, I have a playlist where I unbox the game real quickly and went through some of the core mechanics, and so I talk all about it there. But basically, you have these cooldown counters, and when you cast the spell, you flip it over and it rotates through its cooldown, and you cast spells using a pool of resources. This is a resource pool game, similar to Guild Ball or um, Infinity, where your characters have a value, and at the beginning of the round, you will add these up and then look at the types of colors, and you will get a pool of tokens. Um, I have them around here somewhere, yep, right here. And then you will use these tokens and you will spend them to cast your spells and do all that kind of stuff. And the way it's set up, it's very interesting because combat definitely isn't like the core of this, where it's like, I'm gonna cast damage spells at you until you die. We'll talk about that again in a minute. It's much more the idea of the duel. So for example, this spell right here that Hermione has, it is a combat spell, it's Perfectus Totalis. Combat spell, target model suffers the Petrify effect, which basically just means they completely lose um, an activation until a challenge is passed. And so you can lock up a model for, for a round or even multiple rounds. And so slinging um, special effects at one another that make it so you can't move, can't cast spells, can't activate at all, limiting each other, um, balancing activations. That is really what this is all about. It's not a go in, sling spells at each other, do a bunch of damage. And so that's really interesting in the beginning. Um, and I was excited about this. This is what drew me to the game when I was watching videos about it. And my son and I are like, that seems really interesting. I wanna check out that game. But when you grab that core box and you open it up and you throw it out on the table and you start uh, looking at how this is gonna be implemented, you find that things start getting really complicated really quick, all right? And that has to do with how the scenarios are built. We'll walk through this, the first scenario in the book and kind of my son and I's first experience with it in a little bit. But basically the scenarios, they all have on their own objectives. <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of the objectives of the scenarios are based around combat, you know, defeat this many. Or um, they're movement based, as in you got to get all your guys to this other location. And then alongside of that, there is a deck of objective, secondary objectives that you're going to be drawing from. 
and you are going to have three of those available to you at any time, and that's how you're going to score more objectives. And again, those are very much they're either based around combat, cast this many successful spells, or knock somebody out, or movement. Go to this location, do this type of challenge, and either get points or then you got to go to another location. So um, the game very much revolves around um, getting your minis around and then doing combat spells. Here's where things started kind of falling apart for me. So let's just talk about the combat spells piece of it. So right now I have his the Hogwarts trio and I have them set up so that I have maximized the amount of combat spells and also combat spells that do damage. And you, I talked about this before in those other videos, but in this game, everybody has four health basically, or you can take four points of damage. When you take that fifth point, you're then taken out of action. There are special rules that modify this, but none of those special rules are in the actual core box. Okay, there's nobody that is huge or large or whatever um, where you can get multiple damage tokens. It's just everybody takes four damage, and when you take that fifth damage, they get knocked so let's out. Let's take a look at how much damage can one of these can the Hogwarts trio as a whole do to the Death Eater team uh, in a over the course of several rounds. So if you look at, here's the starting, and I just did these guys with the spells, because they're wizards, so I'm casting spells. So Harry, um, for combat spells, basically I equipped everybody with a Stupefy, which is target model suffers one physical damage. Stupefy is the only spell that comes in the core box that actually does damage. And because we're doing the core box, well, everybody um, can only have one version of it. Well, actually, I guess I'm looking at it, there's nothing that says that, uh, like, Harry couldn't have two stupefies equipped. But there's only, um, there's enough stupefies in the game, in the box, plus the stupefies that are innate on the Death Eater, so that everybody could have stupefied. So if you're trying to split it so everybody has, like, a fair game, you're only getting one stupefy in each character, which means, in a single round, if I cast stupefy with Ron, and then I cast stupefy with... Hermione, and then I cast Stupefy with Harry. If all three of those hit a single Death Eater, I have done three damage to that Death Eater. Now, I'm not actually going to do that because the Death Eaters have Death Eater masks. So the first time this model suffers damage in the game, it reduces the number of damage markers received by one. So he's gonna take two damage. So he's going to get on you know, Mr. Death Eater, if I put a Death Eater card you know, right over here, uh, I'm going to hit him with one guy if I'm successful with all three casts. Okay, if I'm successful with all three casts. First damage is going to go away. Then he's going to get a damage token. All right, and then we're going to flip that damage token over in that first round. So I'm going to, of the four Death Eaters, I'm going to be able to hit one Death Eater for two damage if I focus my damage. Or I could hit three Death Eaters for zero damage of the masks or you know you could do the math at this point i believe in Shay and josh okay well you know he's half dead so next round we could kill him except no because when the next round starts this stupefy cooldown goes this stupefy cooldown goes this stupefy cooldown goes so the next round if in round one which you're not actually gonna do it in round one we'll talk about that in a minute in round one if my entire team stupefies a single death eater and gets him knocked down by half. In round two, I have zero spells that have the ability to do more damage. When round three comes along, these guys will all flip again. And now, as long as two of them success, no, I, at this point, so if a third one, if I hit him again for a third time, he successfully uh, you know, I, I shoot somebody. Where's my damage tokens? Where'd I put those guys? Right here. Uh, then, when that third one hits, doo -doo -doo, this token goes away, and now we get this token. Then when my fourth one successfully hits, he gets that token. And then my fifth one, so all three guys, again, have to successfully hit the same Death Eater. Now he's removed from the game, and that's one of four Death Eaters. And it took three rounds with zero failures in hitting with Stupefy. It used all my actions, 
and all my actions had to be successful. So in three rounds, I can kill one Death Eater. If I repeat this process, after six rounds, I'll have killed two Death Eaters. And then the game ends at eight rounds. So if I go all out attacking with spells, then um, all I have accomplished the entire game, I have not messed up anybody's activations. I have not um, completed um, any uh, secondary objectives. I, you know, I haven't done anything else other than stupefy, 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 and then spent a round in there not stupefying. So I guess I have done some other stuff. I can kill half the team. That's it. And so what I learned was, okay, if I'm in a scenario in which I have to take out miniatures, opposing miniatures, or if I am trying to do secondary objectives where I have to do damage to take out miniatures, it is better actually to not concentrate on my spell casting. It is better to uh, equip my Hogwarts, her Ron, Hermione, and uh, Harry, not with spells, because they're wizards, but to give them a sword and a knife. In fact, based on the mechanics of the game, Ron is far more effective with a sword than he is a spell casting. Because Ron has one mastery. He gets one automatic success when casting a spell. This sword has a bonus of two, which means it gets two automatic successes. You are, and it does two damage as opposed to the one damage that Ron can do. So you are more likely to hit and you will do more damage if you give Ron the run-of-the-mill sword. It isn't even like the sword of Gryffindor. If you give Ron the run-of-the-mill sword. And so I make sure that I take away his Deluminator and I give him a sword. And then for good measure, um, Harry or Ronnie should probably take a knife. <laughs> and then there's only one knife and one sword in the core box. So your teams are going to be uneven in this respect. And the Death Eaters are going to suffer from the same problem of doing damage with casting spells, except they can actually do it four times. So they, if they go all out casting damage spells, uh, they're much more likely to take out a member of the Hogwarts trio with magic than the Hogwarts trio is to the Death Eaters. Um, so basically, I need more swords. All right, so that's that core mechanic and how it actually worked out for us. Let's, uh, I want to go over a couple other things that it would be really important, I think, for people to know before they jump into this. And then I'm kind of going to walk you through our first player experience and what happened with that. And then how I think that this is going to be repeated through other so aspects what are of it. the like kind of significant problems? I think the biggest one, uh, I mean, for me, it was the miniatures, but we'll talk about that later. The biggest one for me was the rule book. Uh, the rule book is really bad with respects to the rule books that I'm used to, and I've read a lot of rule problem books. really is um, it, the, it's just not written very well, and it's not formatted very well, I don't think. Um, there was a couple rules, especially for uh, rolling extra dice and then rolling extra lucky dice, which is two separate mechanics that it was a hard time for me to kind of navigate through. Uh, I did figure that one out, but there was a specific rule, and I'll talk about that in a second, that um, I actually had to go on, find a FAQ, which was very difficult because the Knights Models website is very difficult to find information. And it, I re it required me to read the FAQ to correctly understand how the rule is to be played. If you just have this rule book and you do it uh, with your best guess as to how the rules are written, you're going to get wrong and you're going to play the game incorrectly. So the, the biggest problem I had, again, was the quest cards. And I'll, I'll say this now so that if you're actually going to get the game and play it, which... Go for it, that's what you want to do. Uh, you're gonna get this wrong, probably. Um, everybody that I've watched online gets this wrong, unless they look at the FAQ. So it says, unless otherwise instructed by the scenario rules, both, which I'm pretty sure in the core box, like it's, you always do this. Uh, both players must draw three cards from the quest deck at the start of the game. Each player can choose and discard one of their quest cards and draw a replacement from the deck. Well, once all the players have their cards, they are placed face up beside the game board and remain in play until the quest detail and the card is fulfilled. Once a quest card is fulfilled, another quest card is drawn to replace it. Hard players cannot draw more than six replacement quest cards during the game. I had a lot of questions about this. So there's quest cards. Look at the back here. And so I wasn't sure. Um, so we each one draw three and replace. And then we put them face up. And I was I didn't understand, like, okay, are these three mine? Do we put them all together? Can we complete each other's? And then how are players cannot draw more than six resets? Is that per player? Is that both players put together? 
like, can we just, between the two of us draw six, or each one of us draw six, or just one draw three, another draw three, and I wasn't sure. And so I went online and found the FAQ, and I actually finds out in the FAQ that there's, there's two quest decks in the core box. They're identical. Each player has their own quest deck that they're using independent of one another. That, I, I, maybe it's just me, that was not indicated at all in here. And um, you're never, you know, each player has an identical set of these. So if you're both drawing from the same set, you can get the same objective twice and that's not supposed to be the way it works. And then I still was unsure if both of you could redraw six because it didn't say in the FAQ. So I just assumed that yes, you could. But the thing is, there's only like seven of these in here. So it's kind of weird. Um, and it just really bothered me that th there was a rule in the book that I had to go to an outside resource in order to learn how to play the game correctly. And then that wasn't even the biggest problem that ended up having the quest cards. We'll talk a few about other things just about the organization of the book. For example, here's building, organizing your group. And it gives you the rules for how you build your group. I did a video on that. Um, it talks about upgrades. And says there are specific limitations on the number of type of spell and potion cards each model may purchase. These are covered in details in the magic section. I'm like, why? Why would you say, why would you have rules for building your group and not put them in the section for organizing your group and say, go to this other section of the rule book? They do that a lot where you can't go to one section and get all the rules you need for that actual section. And it's just, I don't know, it's just kind of annoying. And then on top of that, the thing that really got me is the, uh, the, the index of special, uh, both uh, effects and special rules. Let me find it real quick. Special rules and the traits, like Animagus and, uh, you know, Chosen One, Dark Arts, Dark Lord, all that stuff. It's, it's in the very middle of the book. So when you're trying to find these during a game, it's, it's instead of just being like, oh, flipping open the back, where these things usually are in rule books, you, you gotta go hunting for it. And I just found that to be kind of like, why? why? Why did you organize it that way? And I know it's not that big of a deal, but when I got to the point in the game where it just seemed like there was just a lot of stuff, this, you know, it kind of got to me as well. Um, and again, the, the second edition rule book aesthetically is different, but the rules are exactly written the same. So if you get the second edition of the game, you're gonna have the same problems with the rule book. You know, or I, you potentially could have the same problems with the rule book. Um, that I, then, uh, I sat down and played my first game. So let's zoom right, out. So this is the setup for the first scenario that's in the book. It's even referred to in the book as this is the first scenario that you can play. All right, it's the Forbidden Forest. And um, I just put Team Hogwarts over here on this side and I put Team Death Eater over here on this side. Scenario special rules. And so this one is uh, last for eight rounds. You obtain victory points by defeating enemies and overcoming the danger of the Forbidden Forest. And so it didn't say not to do objectives, so we did objectives. But in here, the range, all spells, the range is limited to five. Uh, limited to three. Okay. And there was, there's random events that are going to take place at the beginning of every round also get one victory point for every other enemy model defeated but we already talked about defeating models a little bit so earlier we set up the game and then we started drawing objective cards and we both ended up drawing this card right here recover which says your opponent must place one objective marker on the board not closer than three spaces to any board edge any friendly model in a space adjacent the marker during its activation can remove the marker from the board Place that marker on the model's character card as a reminder. If during any round, the model with that marker enters its original deployment zone, score three victory points and discard this card and the marker. If the model is removed from play while it has the marker, then place the marker in any space adjacent to the model before removing it. Okay, so I draw this. I'm playing the Hogwarts Trio. So my son grabs an objective marker and he's like, oh, okay, it's gotta be anywhere from three edges from a board edge. So of course he puts it way over there. So in order for me to go get that and return to my deployment zone, which again is way over there, to get those three victory points, I have to walk 17 spaces over there. I counted it. And then I got to walk 17 spaces back. Pick this up because each character in the game has a movement of three. So in order to move a total of 34 spaces to get that objective, and to get back over there 
It's going to take 11 rounds. There's only 8 rounds in the game. There is a spell for apparating, which one character can have that lets you move 8 in a single round, but then it's on cooldown for a while. And in these challenge cards, which will come up a little bit later, um, it is possible to get one additional movement. But again, those are circumstances that happen a few times over the course of the game. It would have to shave three rounds worth of movement off of the game in order for anybody to be able to complete that objective. And that's if the entire game, that's what you're doing. You are moving, you're never missing a move, which there's spells that are gonna make you miss moves. Um, there's difficult terrain that's gonna slow you down. There's other models that are gonna slow you down. And so if you can't accomplish 11 rounds worth of movement through your regular moves and any spells and other people not hindering that, that's a dead objective. You can't do it. So then we also got land grab. If at the end of a round, at least two friendly models are in space within or adjacent to opponent's deployment zone, score two victory points and discard this card. Now that's a little bit better than um, the recover, but again, it's in order to get from this deployment zone to that deployment zone, this is one round of movement, two rounds of movement, three rounds of movement, four rounds of movement, five rounds of movement, five rounds out of eight rounds of just moving across the board without, with, you know, just, just that. And so if you deviate from that at all, you're, you're significantly hindering your ability to accomplish. Treasure. Right. Your opponent placed an objective marker within four spaces of any board edge. Any friendly model in space adjacent to that marker during its activation can take a Wisdom 10 challenge. Uh, so again, that's three spaces. That's four spaces. The three spaces, guess where the four space one's gonna go? It's still 17 spaces. It's still six rounds worth of movement. And in order to do a Wisdom 10 challenge, you're gonna need at least two of your characters there. So two of your characters got to do this one. Uh, Priceless Treasure goes back to three spaces. It's a Wisdom 16. You have to have three characters. If you do the Hogwarts true, your entire team has to move all the way across the other side of the board in order to grab that one. All right, Defend. If there are no enemy models in a space within or adjacent to your original deployment zone. Okay, so in order for that team to get over there, to get to the, again, it takes at least five rounds of movement. Okay, Defeat Them. Here's where we start getting some combat stuff. Uh, when two enemy models are removed from playing the same round, score two victory points. Remember we talked earlier, it takes three rounds to eliminate one. So it will take you six rounds of splitting your damage in order to put enough damage so that on a, four, a further round, you could take two of them out. This will take you the entire game if you're casting spells. If you take a sword, it'll be a lot easier. But this secondary objective is gonna take, again, focus, and then so if I'm hanging around in range to shoot, to get my opponents with this, I'm not spending all my rounds running across the board to accomplish the other second. Treasure trove, back to movement, again, you, you gotta get across the entire board. Uh, spell slinging, this one is actually a little more reliable, but again, you gotta hit three or more enemy models with combat spells. You gotta do that, everybody has to, Everybody's got, if you're the Hogwarts Trio, and almost if you're the Death Eaters, everybody has to spend a whole turn during combat spells. Um, and so, you know, that's a whole turn where you're putting damage on people, which probably isn't going to take them out, and you're not accomplishing other stuff. And then, um, yeah, that's that's the opposite of, of, like, the last one. And then this one is just a random one. When you score any number of VPs during a round, score one additional point. This is the best one, because... Uh, you may, in scoring a primary objective, like in a random event, you might actually get a point in doing that one. So the objective cards became very difficult, and especially like, I got very frustrated with this idea of recover, because in my scenario, it was impossible. We couldn't do it, we didn't have enough time. Uh, and this whole long board setup is very common, and then there's even some scenarios that don't have deployment zones. So you can't even do this. Um, and so you need to know that if you're gonna play that scenario, you need to dig in your deck and pull this one out. Which again, if you're playing for the first time, you're not gonna know that kind of stuff. And there's no indication of even like customizing your objective decks and that kind of stuff. It, you, you're just kind of assuming that, well, it seems dumb, so we're gonna house rule it so we can take, um, we can take this kind of thing out. So the objectives are just very frustrating and they, take what seems like this really cool mechanic of the game and then you're not even like really using it. 
Um, in fact, we found that uh, the best way to score points is to run past each other and try to go pick up those treasures and that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, some of those challenges can be very difficult, actually. You need two, three, or sometimes if you're the Death Eaters, you need all four of your models to move to the other side of the board um, and basically you know, throw some spells at the Hogwarts trio as you're passing each other as you're running to go grab each other's objectives. Okay. So in our first game, one of the other things that really became cognizant of us, to us was there's a significant problem with uh, this event deck that we got going on right here. Excuse me, I'm bumping stuff. Uh, so this is, this is, I've spread out the event deck. So at the beginning of every round, whichever player has initiative flips over an event. And at first it was like, oh, random events. But we quickly started having a significant issue with this. And that's because the way initiative is calculated is um, you add up the cunning value, which is this guy right here. And so you add it up on your characters. So if you add up the cunning value of the Hogwarts trio, they always have five. There's three of them. If you add up the Death Eaters, they always have four. Because uh, they only have one cutting a piece. So the Hogwarts Trio always has initiative until there's a change in party. So if the Death Eaters manage to knock one of them out, then uh, their initiative changes. If they manage to knock out Ron, then the initiative only drops to four. In which case, they're tied. When it's tied, the book says that the heroes win the tie. Um, but you only have one side who, according to the rules, is heroes in when you're playing a campaign. If you're playing a regular duel, it doesn't actually say these guys are the heroes and these guys aren't. So you got to have to figure that one out. Uh, if you take out Hermione or Harry, then it would actually drop you under to three. But that's if none of the Death Eaters die. So basically for our whole game, because we talked about how hard it is to kill people, um, when we played, it mostly always was the Hogwarts Trail that had the initiative. So they always got to draw the event card. Here's where this became a problem. The event deck, which is 16 cards into four different piles. And I split them into these four different piles because these cards right here, these cards, when you draw them as an event, they benefit you and only you and they're detrimental to your opponent. Okay, for example, some things like this one right here. Um, this lets the player who drew the card put a uh, Arrokamanchala, which I'm not even gonna talk about those. Um, but basically it's a monster. You get an additional figure and you get to control it. Uh, choose one of your quest cards, exchange it with your opponent. Uh, this one is you put a Boggart on the map, and if you can put it in such a way, and again, this is, I guess, there's situations where this isn't always good for you, but I got it like the first round. I was able to put it so that uh, basically two of his Death Eaters just missed the entire activation, and you can manipulate that so that it doesn't hurt you. Uh, draw a card from the Adventure deck. You're the only one that get, uses it. You get a bonus one. That's another Akamanchula. Um, Bludgers, um, same thing. You can put objective markers near your enemies, take damage. You can you can make it so this does not hurt you and only hurts your opponent. And uh, yeah, all that stuff. These, you can manipulate these so that they're 100% beneficial to you and 100% detrimental to your opponent. There may be situations where if you're where if you're close to God on the board, that might be more difficult. But again, if you're running to get objectives, you're probably not gonna be close. There are seven of these, which comprises 44% of the deck. So almost half. These ones right here are actually good for both players. All right, there's three of them. That's 14% of the deck. So 63% of the deck, when you're drawing an event card, it's gonna be beneficial to you. All right, right here, there's five cards, 31% of the deck, that these are detrimental to both players. It hurts both of you. Um, and so, and these ones, again, uh, you're not, you don't have an advantage, but you're not giving your opponent advantage. There's one card in the deck. Remove two power points from your power pool that is detrimental to you entirely. 6%, one card, which means 63% of the time you're punching your opponent, or 44% of the time you're punching your opponent in the face, and 19% of the time you're giving him the same benefit that you're getting, all right? 31% of the time you're both taking a hit, 6% of the time you are the only one taking a hit. And remember, it's the player that has initiative that draws this, so when we played, whoever was playing the Hogwarts Trio, they got to do this every single time. And more than half the time, they're punching their opponent in the face. Every single time. And you may be saying, okay, Josh, that may be true, but there's those adventure cards that you draw three every game, and whoever goes second, they're going to get to play two of these. That is totally true. These don't come into play very often. Um, 
In fact, we found ourselves most of the time we would just take one and burn one so the other guy wouldn't get it. These are nowhere near significant as the events. And so the events create this scenario where one player, whichever player has the initiative most rounds of the game, because you have, like, it's party built. So at the beginning of the game, you know, okay, this group is going to have initiative until one of their dudes gets taken out of action, which is not a common thing. We talked about that. Um, they're going to be consistently playing these events and getting advantage, 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 advantage. And so we just stopped doing it because it was feel bad, you know, me doing this to my son. Um, cause I was playing the Hogwarts guys most of the time. And so it's just, it's a really bad experience and the way the mechanics set up, it's not balanced at all. Like random events, uh, need to, need to not significantly favor one team over the other statistically throughout the entire course of the game. And this will based on how it is built up here. Even like through that, there was just other little, like, I guess I'll start getting into the feel bad moments where you have this thing that's happened. You're like, oh, that's neat. And then you realize, oh wait. Like, it's not at all. Like, collapse. Uh, beginning with the, the player who plays this event, players take it in turns to place three impassable terrain overlays into the open terrain spaces. So it's like, oh, you get more terrain. Here's the thing. You only get five terrain overlays, and you put three of them out at the beginning of the game. So when you draw this, you, you can't even do it. Um, you don't have three additional terrain pieces to put out. And I'm like, oh, well, that's just kind of dumb. Like, why are we doing that? Next feel bad moment, uh, Death Eaters. So first of all, when you open up when you open up that box, and the Harry and the Ron miniatures, they're pretty, you know, they're interesting. It looks like Harry, it looks like Ron. You know, awesome. Uh, you open it up and the Hermione miniature is just like gr great. Um, like you can definitely tell they were sculpting for the audience. Like that's great. And then the other guy, you get these four Death Eaters that basically, all look exactly the same. And they're just literally, they are uh, Death Eater 1, Death Eater 2, Death Eater 3, and Death Eater 4. Who coincidentally, all these grown adult Death Eaters are all significantly weaker than the Hogwarts trio. But anyway, it's a heroic thing. And then, so that's just kind of a meh, like it's a little disappointing. Uh, they all look the same. And then what really happens is you identify your guy based on this little portrait. And I would argue, like, these two portraits right here, they're pretty similar. And we found ourselves in a situation where it was easy to confuse which death he was which we were playing. We we ended up having to do little marks on the bases. So we could be like, that was Death Eater 2 and that was Death Eater 1. And it really, um, it... It again, it made just playing the basic game a little bit more difficult. It was less fun when it's like, oh wait, which Death Eater is he? Okay, I move him over here. Oh, this Death Eater is that Death Eater. And it just became difficult. It was a little easier if you could establish the fact that this Death Eater uh, was the female Death Eater, but then I think it's this one. So I think Death Eater 3 is the female. And that helped a little bit, but. You know, I don't know. It just, it wasn't, it added an element of unfun to the game, which is not, you don't want to, you don't want to have unfun when you're playing games. Um, you know, you want to have fun when you're playing games. But when we're building parties, uh, we have potions, which if you have a potioneer in your group, for example, like this character right here, potioneer, uh, that means she, her party, she can make level one potions and, and her party can equip them, which is great, except for there's only, Three level one potions in the game, and they're not even and um, they're not uh, duplicates. So you're gonna figure out a way to split these up, and then you get all these other potions, which are like, yay, we got these more potions. You can't use any of them in the base game. Uh, you can't equip any of them. So there's there's stuff in the base game that you actually can't play with the base game. Then as you're reading through the rule book you have kind of the opposite experience. So for example, right here, Unforgivable Curses. There are three spells in the deck. There are three spells in the deck. So it says they are in the deck, which are special indeed. These are the Unforgivable Curses. Crucio, Imperio, and Avada Kedavra. These are de designated by their special reverse side. This is the picture. No model can carry or cast Unforgivable Curse unless it has the Dark Arts trait. So then, 
Okay, I was reading through there and I was like, hey, wait a second, all of the Death Eaters have the Dark Arts trait. I'm gonna cast some Unforgivable Curses, except I got my deck, and I'll just show you, illustrate it from the back. These are magic spells. There's some artifacts in there too. Uh, magic spells, magic spells, magic spells, magic spells, spell, 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 artifact, 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 artifact. Um, how many Unforgivable Curses did you see in the deck? In the deck, definite article, the deck. This is the deck. How many Unforgivable Curses did you see in there? Zero. The book tells you there's three special curses. They're in the deck. Only Dark Arts characters can use them. They give you four Dark Arts characters. They don't give you any Unforgivable Curses. I don't even know how to get them. Maybe Voldemort expansion? I have no idea. They're not in the game. And so you're reading through the rule book and you're like, oh, this is a cool thing. Except it's not because you can't actually do it. You have this experience several more times as you're moving through. Patronus marker. Harry has Expecto Patronus because it's like a signature spell from the movie. You get a Patronus marker. The Patronus marker fights against Dementors. How many Dementors do you get in the game? Zero. And so Harry's cool spell, Expecto Patronus, that puts a marker on the board that fights against Dementors just turns into a defense buff, which you can't move away from in a game that you have to spend so much of your time moving to complete objectives. Feel bad. Okay, and then here's an even a weirder one. Dueling. This is in that, you know, the middle of the book index thing. This trait will appear in a future expansion. I'm like, oh, okay, so they're gonna add dueling later. I don't, I don't need to do, do that. And then I'm looking at my uh, uh, Death Eaters. He's got dueling. <laughs> so we got Death Eater, generic Death Eater 2, who has dark arts, but who cares because I don't have any for verses and I have dueling, which I don't have rules for. So this guy, like, there's no reason for him to even have this box. Like, it does nothing for the game. And and you look at it and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm gonna cast some dark arts. What's dueling? And you, you don't have it. Like, it just doesn't do anything. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that feels bad a little bit. There's more of these and I decided that I wasn't gonna go through and nitpick every aspect of the game um but you know hopefully i've shared enough of you enough with you guys so that you can have an appreciation for the unfun experience that my son and i kept having as we were playing this game um a game that's supposed to be about like harry potter and spell slinging and all that and in the end, we were just frustratingly running around trying to cover as much ground as we can to eke out some victory points and finding, you know, one objective that we could complete amongst all the objectives that it was giving us, knowing that more than likely we weren't going to take anybody out. More than likely, we weren't going to get across the board twice. And it became less about um, having a real cool wizarding experience and more about, all right, how can I find a, navigate a path in these strange and unfun mechanics to pull out a win so here's kind of my my final thoughts on this whole thing and I'll, I'll address it in two different ways the first thing is if you go on amazon right now you can pick up the first edition of this game for 50 dollars, which is a lot less than 120 dollars. and again the main difference is uh the miniatures have a higher quality resin and the punch board stuff is all on actual cardboard now same as the boards should i do that i would say no um so you load it, I got right here, um, you know, it's Harry and Hermione. They don't have wands anymore, Harry and Ron. Uh, my son literally like flicked by accident the end of Ron's wand with his knuckle, I think, like caught at the edge of the knuckle and it flew off. Hermione's uh, knocked over by accident, her wand broke. And then this arm actually, uh, I had problems, it fell off and I had to end up pinning it. I have a video about it. So, I mean, the miniatures, although they look pretty good, the quality of them is just pretty bad. And then even building them, like I built a lot of miniatures. There's videos on my channel of me building miniatures. Um, I had a very frustrating time building these miniatures. It was very unfun. Um, and even like I have sticky tack holding with the bases because I want to paste ba the bases different. And like the out of the box experience, like you're not gonna be able to sit down and play it this game if you buy the first edition. You're gonna have to frustratingly put miniatures together. The second edition is tokens. You could play with tokens first if you wanted to. So I would say um, don't spend $50 on the first edition of this game. And with that being said, knowing um, I can't speak about higher quality resin, I'm not 
I'm not um, familiar with resin, so I don't know if the miniatures would be that better. You still have to assemble them. And I don't really care about the punch boards. Should you spend $120 on the second edition of this game? And I guess my advice to you would be no. If I had spent $120 on this, even if the miniature, uh, the wands wouldn't have broken, and if those were better cardboard, if I'd spent $120 and had the feel bad experience that I've consistently had with this game, I'd probably be upset. I don't really care about it right now because I went in with this with my son, so I spent like 20, 20 something dollars and it was worth a try. And someday maybe I'll paint the minis. But I think if you're looking for a good miniature skirmish game out of the box experience, and you're really into the whole pool building mechanic, power pool, just pick up Guild Ball or maybe Infinity. And if you don't care about the pool building, you just want like some cool minis and some cool boards and sit down and throw it down, get like Warhammer Underworlds. Uh, all those games are like between $50 and $60. So it's potentially less than half what you're paying for this. And you're gonna get a significantly better experience, or I would, I think you're gonna get a significantly better experience out of the core box. Now, is it possible that if you go all in and buy a bunch of other cool stuff and you buy Voldemort and you buy, you know, Dumbledore and you get the um, Dumbledore's army figures and you get Bellatrix and Wormtail and Sirius Black and Lupin and you get all those characters that a lot of these feel bad moments in the core box are not going to be your experience? Probably. And I think that's probably what's going on here. But you're gonna have to go through this core box experience first and then dish out quite a bit of money before you get that. And I think what happened- I don't know. I, didn't, I haven't talked to these guys at Knights, Knights Models. They seem like really nice guys. They seem very passionate, you know. I don't think they're bad people, you know. I just think they made a bad game here. Um, I think because of the way it started with Kickstarter, the design, the playtesting, like their intent for the game is everything. And I wonder if they actually sat down and played through the core box experience and say, okay, what is this game going to be like for someone who drops $120 and gets just this and sits down and plays it for the first time? And they do the scenario that we say is the first scenario. And they, you know, haven't, they didn't, they don't read all the event decks and they, and, and, you know, the, the model building and they've never played before and they're excited about slinging those spells and killing some death eaters and doing the thing. What experience are they going to have? Because I think if they did, they would have seen all the stuff that I've seen and been like, wow, we can't let this be our core box experience. But the, but I don't, again, I don't know. And, and maybe it's just me. Again, you don't know me. So I could just be a total idiot and have no idea what I'm talking about. But this is the experience that I had. And I've tried to explain to you why I think I had that bad experience and called out a few things and highlighted a few things. And I'm telling you, I'm probably not going to play this again. I may paint these minis if I get bored. I might let my kids paint them. Um, UPS is showing up my house today with Warhammer Underworld Shade Spire. And the minis are going to be better. The boards are going to be better. The components are going to be better. The experience and the rules are going to be better. My son and I are just going to play that. Oh, we're probably not going to bust this out again. And I'm, you know, I'm actually, I'm paying more on Shade Spire. No, I'm paying less on Shade Spire because my son's paying more. Than you did before. And I got this at a steep discount. And I'll end up paying less than half. If you go out and you buy the brand new. Second edition core box for $120. So I would say save your $120. Buy Shade Spire. Buy Guild Ball. Buy Infinity for like $50, $60. Or if you really want to spend that $120. Um, you know. Go pick up the Rogue, Tra Rogue Trader Kill Team starter box. Or you know. Save up some more money. And get the Warcry starter box. Or the new Kill Team starter box that's coming out. And you'll get better models with better components, and you get a better game. You'll have a better experience. That's all I have to say about the Harry Potter Miniatures Adventure game. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below. If I'm wrong, tell me in the comments below. If I'm just an idiot who doesn't know what I'm talking about, put that in the comments below. YouTube likes interaction, even if it's negative interaction. Thumbs up, thumbs down, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you were excited about my Harry Potter major game content, I'm really, really sorry. You're not going to see any more. You may see me paint these minis someday, but you probably won't because I don't think I'm going to run out of minis. Oh, I feel bad. I feel bad making a negative review, but I don't want other people to spend $120 and have a similar experience to me. If you spend $120 and have a better experience, that's great. I'm so happy for you. If you spend $120 and have the same experience that I did, I feel really bad for you. 
Um, that's a bummer. Um, hopefully you will watch this video before you do that and think, okay, I think I'll have the same experience that he does. So I'm not going to do that. I'll have a better experience. And um, I'm going to do some similar stuff like I did with this for uh, Warhammer Underworlds. So if you were looking at this and now you're like, uh, I don't think that's a good idea, hang out for a month or two if you can be patient. And I'll show you some Warhammer Underworlds. And I think you'll have a much better experience. And then I'll probably also show you some more Kill Team. And you can have a much better experience with that too. All right. Let's try to end on a positive note. There's great games out there. Go find one of those. Don't give this one. Talk to you later.